He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 9. New from Star Labs. A little emotional support went a long way. Making new friends with common interests gave Clark the push he needed to put his best into being Superman. It was a much needed push. Though he was still present in the world as a hero, he felt a vague sense of lacking ever since his first encounter with Kryptonite. Onlookers couldn't see it, but Superman had become selective about where and when he saved people. He was discreet about it, but he had no choice. When it came to properties owned by LexCorp, he was never sure if he could risk entering. The chance of kryptonite being present at any of Luther's properties made him hesitant to go anywhere near them. Unless, of course, he was directly requested to get involved. Clark hated being at Luther's disposal when beckoned. It would have been humiliating if the world was aware of how Luther manipulated him. Instead, Clark carried the shame that he could only save LexCorp employees when he was allowed to. For many incidents, he was strictly forbidden by Luther himself from intervening. Luther's high-frequency messaging device served as his own personal pager for contacting Superman. It didn't happen often, but it was often enough for Superman to get the message. LexCorp was off-limits. Powerless to intervene in Lex Luthor's business, Superman devoted hours to watching from afar. He observed the operations of LexCorp facilities throughout the world, making rounds to spy on them using his uncanny eyesight. At first he could only see through walls and into rooms lining the outer perimeter of the buildings. With practice he was able to see deeper into the facilities, peering through the many layers of walls and floors. Superman watched the day-to-day -day routine inside. They all ran as expected. Each lab, factory, and warehouse were exactly what they claimed to be. Yet some of these buildings had more to them than Clark's sharp eyes could see. There were rooms inside that appeared to him as solid blocks, yet occasionally he would see people walking in and out of these blocks. All of these buildings with hidden rooms were kept off limits from Superman. Clark Kent suspected this was a job for a reporter. Throughout an especially stormy winter, he investigated LexCorp's international holdings. As usual, Luther was meticulous in keeping his official records clean. Clark found the only way to learn anything of what was happening in LexCorp's secretive facilities was to hold his ear right up against the buildings and listen. In snow and rain, Clark eavesdropped on the murmur of conversations inside LexCorp Tower. For weeks, it was difficult to make out individual voices. A mixture of words floated through, but one term came up repeatedly in whispers. Project Adonis. Project Adonis was their codename for whatever they were doing inside these rooms hidden to Superman's vision. Clark's investigation of LexCorp never seemed to amount to anything he could write into an article. Even when he thought he could track the different labs and factories that were collaborating on Project Adonis, he was never so sure what they actually did together. Clark had names of engineers and scientists from a broad range of fields working on this clandestine effort at LexCorp, but he had few excuses to approach them and no way to mention Adonis. Clark had no original source but himself. Any of the material he had gathered through spying could expose his identity. After Superman was forbidden from yet another factory fire, Clark attempted to speak to an engineer who had been hospitalized in the accident. He found the man entirely aloof. Even while badly injured, his loyalty to his employer went beyond his concerns for himself and his co-workers. Ron Traup had a term for this. When working on his own story dealing with a corrupt executive board, he called them deep sea fish. You won't catch them with no fishing pole. They're too close to the bottom of it all. They can't say anything without giving themselves away. But you can round them up later with a net when the time comes. They'll be begging to turn on each other. You'll see. Ron's investigation proved to pan out for his story exactly as he foretold. Clark, on the other hand, was deadlocked. He had no story. Only an endless list of unconfirmed suspicions. Ron recognized Clark's frustration and offered some advice. Change up your routine, Kent. You're in a rut. Step back. Take a walk. Spend some time just being in the moment. See where it takes you. After work that day, 
Clark did just as Ron suggested and meandered his way through Metropolis. He didn't listen for calls of distress or seek out the places where he might be needed. Staying present in the moment, Clark's path brought him to a hot dog stand he once ate at, years ago, on his first day in Metropolis. Eating his dinner as he continued, Clark appreciated Ron's advice. He needed a new perspective. Almost by accident as he wandered, Clark came upon his own apartment. Checking his mailbox and hoping for a letter from Lana, Clark found a cryptic postcard. It had no address and just one sentence. Ray is ready to see you. It said nothing more but was postmarked in Gotham. Clark wasted no time and flew up to Ivy University the next afternoon. He was reluctant entering the lab, knowing this was where Jean Jones had brought the kryptonite. But Ray Palmer assured him he wouldn't be harmed. I've built a dampening field around the kryptonite. You'll be fine. Come on in. As Ray promised, suspended in a vacuum-sealed case behind immensely thick glass, under an intense red light, was a cluster of kryptonite. Clark felt no effect from it. Whoa, that's a lot more than a shard. Palmer laughed a single dry, huh, you don't know the half of it. That pile there has actually been shrunken by 500 times its mass. Excuse me, what? Yeah, I don't really have the space to store this much kryptonite at full size. Clark didn't know what was more shocking, the sheer mass of kryptonite, or that Ray Palmer so casually shrunk it by 5,000%. Where did you get it all? Oh, just using Mr. Terrific's map. The Flash and I have been gathering it from all over North and South America. Just you and the Flash? Oh yeah. So, you must have a super suit of your own. Do you have your own superhero moniker too? Oh sure. They call me The Atom. Clark had never heard Professor Ray Palmer be called this before. So, do you somehow move at super speed as well? Oh no. Nothing like that. I shrink down real tiny and ride behind one of those wings on Barry's mask. You what? Oh boy. Batman really sent you in blind for this, didn't he? He told me you made super suits. Palmer single dry, huh, <laughs> rang out. Is that what he told you? He wouldn't even let me make his suit. At least not all the way. Batman didn't trust me to do it at Star Labs, so we had to go to extra lengths, make it elsewhere. Why not Star Labs? Oh, uh, he doesn't trust them. Just like he doesn't trust most people. I guess you and I should consider ourselves lucky. How do you mean? Well, for starters, he sure seems to put a lot of thought into making sure you're alright. Yeah? Oh yeah. We've hatched up a plan for containing the kryptonite and eventually destroying it. In the meantime, I've taken the liberty to send Dr. Emil Hamilton my data as well. Emil and I have used it to calibrate a kind of kryptonite repellent field. He's made it portable. That's about all we can do for now to contain the situation. He gave Clark a wink and a thumbs up. A moment passed before Clark realized Ray was making a pun. Yeah, thanks. Before it puts me in the crypt. Ha, <laughs> good one. From Ivy University, Clark flew straight to Star Labs. Rudy, the security guard, could see he was excited and buzzed him in, pumping his fist in the air as Superman ran by. Go Superman! Dr. Hamilton was equally excited by Superman's visit. He could hardly wait to demonstrate his new technology. Superman, I'm so glad you came by. I have something for you. Dr. Hamilton unfurled a shining gold belt, its buckle shaped like the shield on Clark's chest. Indeed, Superman. I hope you like gold because I took some liberties designing it. Here, put it on. I can demonstrate it for you. If it did all that was promised, Clark didn't care what it looked like. Yet he was hesitant to partake in an experiment that involved him being exposed to kryptonite. He reluctantly agreed. He had to know the belt worked. Dr. Hamilton donned a heavy apron, thick gloves, and a face shield. Using a pair of tongs, he took a small piece of kryptonite from his own containment chamber, similar to Palmer's. Once he was sure the belt was securely fit to Superman, Hamilton stood across the room and hurled a small green glowing stone at him. Sure enough, the kryptonite's trajectory came to a stop mid-air and fell straight to the ground several meters away. Clark dared to take a step toward it and the piece of kryptonite slid back on the floor, pushed away by the belt's energy field. Clark felt a new exhilaration. With his new kryptonite repelling belt from Star Labs, Superman not only looked fabulous, but he was able to take on whatever catastrophe occurred, whether Luther forbade it or not. It wasn't long before an experiment of Project Adonis had resulted in yet another laboratory fire. This time, Clark got news of the explosion directly from Luther over his high-frequency telecom. As he, Jimmy, and Lois ate lunch at their favorite booth in the diner across the street from the Daily Planet, he heard Luther's voice faintly speak to him. Should you receive a request for aid from my labs in Coast City, just ignore it. LexCorp shall handle it for ourselves. This was Clark's cue to immediately excuse himself, leaving Lois and Jimmy more than enough money to cover his lunch and a tip for the waiter. In the alley behind the diner, 
Clark ducked out of sight of any watching eyes or passing delivery drones and transformed into Superman. Coast City was across the country, and even flying at his fastest, it was over 40 minutes away. Clark still didn't understand how he had run so quickly while racing the Flash. That race brought him to speeds he had never moved at before or since. Without the Flash to get him there any quicker, Superman rocketed high into the atmosphere, shattering the sound barrier as he came down on LexCorp Laboratories on the West Coast. When he arrived, a massive fire consumed the labs as LexCorp's automated drone system slowly fought it back. Injured technicians were still stumbling out of the building. Superman rushed into the flames, helping everyone he found to get out and returning again to find others. Each time he went in, he attempted to go deeper into the laboratory's central hub. Clark had spied over this operation from afar several times. He knew exactly where in the laboratory he would find the source of the explosion. It was the room that had been hidden from his sight. At the building's core, Clark found it, a chamber built inside of a large auditorium. It was some kind of advanced Faraday cage. Its entrance, a series of antechambers, were all blown wide open from the explosion. Fire continued to jet outward. No one in this part of the building had survived. Clark walked into the heart of the flame. At its center, a small engine ran, radiating enormous heat and light. When he stepped a few meters from the machine, something flew off of it and into the wall opposite to Superman. In that same moment, the engine shut itself off. On the floor of the room, against the wall, lay a large piece of kryptonite. It was much larger than any piece Clark had ever seen before. Even from across the room, he began to feel weakened. Slowly, backing away from the kryptonite and out of the room, Clark was unable to look away from its ill-colored light. Outside of the Faraday cage, his strength started returning. He did not want this machine LexCorp had built to do any more harm. With a piece of heavy debris he found strewn about from the explosion, Superman hurled it back into the chamber, smashing the engine to pieces. On his way out of the laboratory, Clark noticed Lex Luthor himself arriving. Luthor walked assertively in his direction and stopped not far from the press pool gathering a ways off from the burning building. For a moment, the two men looked across at one another, Luthor eyeing Superman's golden belt. When the bald billionaire continued forward to approach him, Superman took off into the sky. With the building clear of survivors and the drones getting the fire under control, he had no reason to stay. Flying back to Metropolis, Clark was astutely aware that Luther would surely not let this act of defiance go without retaliation. When Luther's machinations for revenge finally did close in on Superman, it wasn't Superman he went for. Three days after the lab explosion, Lois Lane was taken hostage by a life-size animatronic toy soldier. In his efforts to rescue her, Superman was attacked by a barrage of miniature toy planes each shooting tiny kryptonite bullets. Thankfully, his new belt deflected the shots, keeping the tiny bullets from ever getting close to him. Once out of ammunition, the toy planes were a trifle to deal with, and the animatronic toy soldiers put up little defense. The frightening experience was soon lost on Lois as she threw herself into Superman's arms. He had saved her a third time. Again, she thanked him with a kiss. We're gonna have to stop meeting like this. I don't think it's up to us, ma'am. Do you think it's some kind of destiny that we keep meeting? You don't even know my name. Uh, I saw you needed help. Oh, more than you know, Superman. Um, I, uh... Lois. Lois Lane. It's a pleasure to meet you. I, uh, think I hear someone calling for me. Goodbye, Miss Lane. Clark flew away as soon as he could. He was being nagged by the sense that he was being deceptive by talking to Lois as Superman. She had no idea why the android had targeted her, but the kryptonite bullets gave Clark no doubt. These weaponized toys somehow tied back to Luther. It begged the question, how did Luther connect Lois to Superman? Clark could only guess that Luther had been aware of her ever since she had infiltrated Hive headquarters. Lois already put herself at risk enough, but thanks to Superman, she had become a target. Clark returned to Star Labs without an appointment. Rudy, the security guard, greeted him. There he is, the Man of Steel! What can I do for you today? Rudy was more than happy to buzz him in. Dr. Hamilton, though bustling about with a project, also delighted in receiving an unexpected visit. Superman, what are you doing here? Did I forget we have an appointment today? Oh, no, Dr. Hamilton. Nothing like that at all. I was just hoping you might be able to help me with another favor. Whatever you need, Superman. Well, you see, a lot of people need my help, 
and some people in particular might need to call me. But I don't really have a phone. Don't say another word, Superman. I have just the thing. A little experimental phone watch device. I can set it up to have global coverage for you by the end of tomorrow. That would be amazing, Dr. Hamilton. Hamilton went above and beyond what was asked of him, making the watch waterproof, bulletproof, heat and cold resistant, and giving it a special interface displaying recent events. Just as the doctor was beginning to explain the finer functions of the watch, it displayed news that at that moment the Daily Planet was under attack. This time, it was an army of tiny tanks. When Superman arrived at the scene, the street in front of the Daily Planet had been overtaken by a small artillery force, dozens of tanks standing only a foot high, brandishing miniature turrets. Scanning the building, Clark could see the tiny armored vehicles were all over the lobby and had made their way into the newspaper offices. There, Lois and the rest of the Daily Planet staff were held captive. They were the prisoners of several more of the same animatronic toy soldiers Clark had dealt with earlier in the week. While Superman made his assessment, the toy tank army took aim on him. They unleashed a flurry of peach-sized globules of sticky goo, a bit of kryptonite at the center of each one. Superman held fast in the coming onslaught of gooey projectiles. To his amazement, they came uncomfortably close before being repelled by his belt. Clark suspected the weight ratio of kryptonite to goo gave this ammunition enough inertia to be less affected by his belt's repellent force, allowing them to come within a couple meters of him. When the tank's direct attack was ineffective, they all turned their fire on the building itself. After the toy army fired its last shot, the building was covered in a layer of sticky globules embedded with kryptonite. Nervous to approach the gooey building, Superman went after the unarmed toy tanks in the street below. In short order, he dispatched them into a pile of wreckage. Yet none of this did anything to free his co-workers from being held hostage. Inside the office, Superman could see the animatronic toy soldiers were now covered in a layer of gooey globules embedded with kryptonite. He would not be able to get close to these androids to disarm them. A cunning plan dawned upon Clark. Using the scrap metal from the wrecked toy tanks, Superman crushed and rolled them into a handful of ball bearings. Entering through the lobby, Clark found it covered in as much goo as the exterior of the Daily Planet, perhaps more so. The walls, ceilings, and floors were all smeared with a sticky ammunition, including the door of the stairwell. Clark stayed airborne as he made his way through the hall, careful to touch nothing as he passed through. With measured force, Superman flicked one of the marbles, activating the button to summon the elevator. Thankfully, when the door slid open, the inside of the carriage was untouched by the kryptonite-embedded globs. As he rode the elevator listening to the gentle music being piped in, the absurdity of the moment was not lost on Clark. Coming into his own workplace as Superman, he was forced to use the elevator and had to hover to avoid the tiny fragments of kryptonite stuck to everything. When the elevator doors opened to the Daily Planet offices, Superman had to act fast if he wanted to minimize casualties. Four animatronic toy soldiers kept the hostages at gunpoint, each of them covered in sticky toxic globs. One of them stood directly outside of the elevator door. With deft precision, Superman threw one of the ball bearings directly through the machine's face, destroying its computer processor. Two more of the toy soldiers found Superman in the hallway outside the offices and met the same fate. With his fellow androids destroyed, the last of them grabbed Lois and shot out the window. Rockets in the robot's feet carried them upward as Lois struggled to break free. Superman took chase and with his last ball bearing, removed the head clean off the droid. When it dropped Lois, he was there to catch her. Yet when he saw she too had the kryptonite embedded globules attached to her, Superman began to sink from the air. He and Lois settled down onto a nearby roof and Superman collapsed completely. What's happening? Are you alright? It's these sticky things. They... They basically take my powers away. They do what? A mess of globs stuck the two of them together. Lois pulled herself away and began peeling the globules of goo off of herself and Superman, throwing them as far away on the roof as she could. When the last of them was removed, Clark began to feel better. I guess you saved me this time. Lois lay down alongside Superman, embracing him. I hope that doesn't mean I can't thank you for saving me. She leaned in toward him, giving him a most passionate kiss. For a moment, Clark forgot they were laying on a rooftop. Wow. You're welcome. Don't mention it, big guy. Actually, at this rate, I'll probably have to save you again pretty soon. That's why I want to give you a number you can call me with. Oh? You want to give me your number? Yeah, I, uh, 
It's so you can call me if you find yourself in trouble again. Do I have to wait until I'm in trouble? This conversation was not going as Clark planned. He awkwardly untangled himself from Lois as he stood back to his feet. Um, probably better to, uh, is there anywhere I can drop you off? With this question, Lois lost a little of her enamored sheen. Yeah, I guess there is. I should probably let my work know I'm okay. Upon flying Lois back to the Daily Planet, Superman collected the remains of one of the animatronic droids along with one of the tanks. They were both drones, controlled remotely. Clark brought them to Star Labs to investigate. Due to the number of delivery drones proliferating the city, it took several days for Dr. Hamilton's colleagues to isolate the signal of these deadly toys. By reverse engineering the technology, they fashioned a handheld device for Superman to track down whoever it was controlling the drones. All he needed to do was wait for the next attack. The high-profile takeover of the Daily Planet had garnered a stir of attention. The repeat attacker had been dubbed the Toy Man. As reporters and officials speculated on what motivated his attacks, none of them managed to connect Lois to both events. No one understood the purpose of the sticky globules either. Weeks dragged by before the Toy Man inevitably made another attempt to capture Lois. Clark was not far from her apartment when she messaged him. She was in trouble. A horde of mechanical spiders were slowly but surely climbing the exterior of her building in mass. Briefly, Superman stopped by her apartment. The cantaloupe-sized spiders were glowing with a familiar sickly green light. Each one of them was equipped with a single chip of kryptonite, mounted to the machine's back. He made no attempt to stop the individual robotic spiders. There was little time to track down the source of the signal controlling them. The device Star Labs gave Superman led him to the industrial district of Metropolis. Facing no defenses, Clark made his way into an abandoned factory, where he found an odd portly fellow sitting at a large, monitor-lit console. The man hadn't noticed anyone was there until Superman unplugged the computer controlling the drones. When his screens went dark, the man turned around to see Superman glowing behind him. He immediately broke into long rows of hysterical laughter. Using his new communication watch, Superman called the Metropolis Police. When they arrived, the toy man was still in hysterics. His name was Winslow Schott. He was a toy maker and inventor with a history of failed businesses, yet no apparent motivation for his crimes. As he was led out of the warehouse, he ranted maniacally. If you want to go after Superman, you go after Lois Lane. That's how you do it. That's how it's done. I figured it out. I figured it all out. The Metropolis Police decided not to release this information to the press. Instead, they went directly to Lois to offer their protection. She doubted there was anything they would be able to do that Superman wasn't already more than capable of. Yet still, the revelation that all of the recent attacks had merely been for Superman's sake left Lois shaken. When she confided in Clark about it, he did his best to act surprised. All for Superman? But how? Why? I'm not so sure. I guess being saved by him more than once put me in the limelight. I guess so. I mean... I've never felt safer than being around Superman, but now I'm starting to wonder. In her moment of vulnerability, Clark comforted Lois. Back at her apartment, they found their romantic spark was far from quenched. Soon the two of them were stumbling into an intimate relationship once again. Yet nothing had changed from before. If anything, there were more complications in this go-around. Being openly in a relationship with Lois made Clark nervous. Beyond his nerves, guilt nagged at him. His worry was not so much for Lois as the rest of his life. Her association with Superman already made her a target. He was certain that if they stayed together, it would only be a matter of time before someone figured out his identity. If Clark Kent were outed as Superman, Martha and Jonathan would be in danger as well. For weeks, Clark considered ending their relationship once more, but he didn't have to. His aloof pondering and inability to put his feelings to words infuriated Lois. She broke it off with Clark again this time swearing it was for good. Clark had to agree. He had no idea how to ensure Lois' safety, but he knew sleeping in the same bed as her would only make it worse. If he wanted Lois to be safe, Superman had to go to the source of the threat. He needed to get to Luther before Luther could get to her. Thank you for listening. 
I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Side of L is written and produced by myself. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC Comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. With additional contributions by Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway, Bill Finger, John Sakella, Bob Kane, Julius Schwartz, Gardner Fox, Gil Kane, John Ostrander, Joe Brzezowski, Marv Wolfman, Jerry Ordway, Don Cameron, and Ed Debrotka. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Blue Dot Sessions, Scan Globe, Pottingham Bear, Abstract Nostalgic Fractal Systems, Jazar, Jack Anderton, Spectacular Sound Productions, Will Bangs, Mellow C, Neo Normalism Crew, Sergey Quadrado, Vortex, and Dan Lizard. See the episode notes for details. If you're enjoying this audiobook, please recommend it to friends and write a review. It's deeply appreciated. Another way to show support is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. A single deck of cards for playing an array of games. And be sure to listen to the next episode. Chapter 10. Bigger Problems. <laughs>